Okay, it's 10.01, so let's, mm -hmm. let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you, Miles. And again, uh, we're asking Miles everybody who's logging in, if, if you're logging in now, if you could just put your name and your organization in the chat box. Uh, we'll use that in, uh, in lieu of doing introductions this morning. So again, put your name and your company or, or your organization in the chat box. Uh, but uh, let's go ahead and get started. You know, I wanted to first off uh, thank Miles and also recognize uh, Doug Simons, uh, who's the chair of our GAC committee. So this morning's presentation uh, with Honua Ola is part of the Howard Island Chamber's Economic Development Committee and uh, GAC committee. And we've also reached out to Toby who's the counterpart at the Japanese Chamber of Commerce as well. So we may have some Japanese Chamber uh, me members that will be joining us as well this morning. So just want to, just want to welcome and send out aloha to everybody. Uh, I wanted to um, introduce our guest uh, speaker or presenter this morning, uh, none other than Warren Lee, who is the president of Honua Ola uh, since 2018. Uh, Honua Ola, formerly known as uh, what was it before? <laughs> <laughs> it still is. Still is and yeah. it's okay. confusing. It's Huhonua. Yeah. Huhonua started off as Huhonua, but Honua Ola now, right, which uh, means living earth, perfect name. Um, and again, Warren, you know, served, uh, you know, our community with many hats. Uh, he, you know, I had a chance to work with Warren uh, during uh, Billy Kenoy's administration with the county of Hawaii. Uh, but he's also, you know, well recognized and known as uh, the former president of, of Helco for many, many years. Um, but with that, he's got the, you know, the, the duty and the honor of leading Honua Ola right now through some challenging times. Um, but if there's any leader that can do it, it's Warren. Not only is he super smart, which I've gotten to recognize through the years, smart, strong leader. But Warren is also one that, I'm, if, if, if you know Warren, uh, he serves our community very well through decades of service to many of our nonprofits. Um, uh, but definitely a well-respected leader, and I wanted to turn it over to Warren, and we'll use, um, give him like maybe 20, 30 minutes, and then after that, we can do Q&A, questions, or you know, open it up for uh, more discussion later. So. Warren, you have the floor. Okay, thank you very much, Randy. Aloha and good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for attending and taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, listen to this presentation. And do we have a, a bunch of slides from which to, you, so that you can follow easier. Uh, the uh, one, one thing to clarify first, first of all, there is Huhunua, Huhunua Bioenergy. Um, that is like the parent company and Honua Ola, Bioenergy LLC is like the operating company. So I serve on uh, as the leader of both of the both of these companies. So so Huhunua still exists. In fact, uh, as we go through the PUC, everything is still in the name of Huhunua Bioenergy and Honua Ola Bioenergy is not recognized for um, from a regulatory side. Yeah. So just some clarification. And it is the Living Earth. And. Uh, uh, so anyway, let me start. Um, I think on the line, uh, we have also Guy Salier. Guy, Dr. Salier is our forest manager. And uh, we've got John Miata, who is the director of finance. And I think on the line we have, uh, on that Honua Ola line, or Huhunua line, uh, is uh, Kevin Owen, who's the general manager of the uh, facility. So, Miles? <coughs> um, can you go to the uh, PowerPoint? So, okay. Uh, we can, here's, here's, this, this is fine. Today is September 9th uh, for, mo, for, mo, for anyone that doesn't know. Uh, and thank you again for having us next. This is the uh, points uh, I wanted to talk about, put it together in a, a quick agenda. 
based on the uh, request I got was you wanted to find out what is the current state of the project. And then I, you know, pretty much I added the rest there. Um, next, Max. Okay, so the current state, uh, here's a quick uh, snapshot on the May 24th of this year, the state Supreme Court issued a favorable decision on our appeal. Uh, and our appeal basically, uh, well, the, well, the court order basically remands the case back to the Public Utilities Commission. That's the third bullet. And uh, why did we have to appeal? We had to appeal because the state, uh, the Public Utilities Commission suddenly closed the docket uh, on us, citing that they were gonna deny the waiver from competitive bidding. Uh, so we said that's not what the issue is based on the, an earlier remand. So we went to the PUC, uh, went to the state Supreme Court and they ruled in our favor. And they basically, the PUC, they said that the PUC, you are obligated to follow the instructions that was provided in May 10, 2019 order, which is, you know, two years previous to May 24, 2021. On June 30th, the Public Utilities Commission set forth a schedule, which has a uh, evidentiary hearing scheduled for mid-January, 2022. So again, Honoa Ola Bioenergy is committed to supporting the state uh, goal of 100% renewables and uh, by 2045. And at this point uh, in the current state, we've expended well over $400 million and not laid off any employees. Next. So this is, uh, how do we get there? <laughs> how do we get here? And uh, this is again, a snapshot. Uh, so the first uh, major event I have listed here is uh, 20, 20, December 20th, 2013. But actually I didn't add this in, but just anecdotally in 2008, um, Kilo Coast Power Company at that time, which was a coal burning facility, came in to see me at Helco and said that they wanted to renegotiate, oh, they wanted to negotiate a new contract for power. And I said, oh, great. What do you folks want to do? You just uh, want to raise the price? So they said, no, we're going to switch from coal to biomass. And, uh, you know, I, I looked to my left and I said, you know, you got to talk to this guy here because I'm retiring in two weeks and his name was Jay Ignacio. So Jay picked up the ball in 2008 and in uh, 2013, uh, the P Public Utilities Commission actually approved the purchase power agreement and they approved it with the, which then the major points were they included it with the pricing that was in the contract and also with the waiver from competitive bidding. So fast forward a couple years, uh, in 2017 of uh, July, the PUC issued another decision in order approving the purchase power agreement for help for Huhunua to sell power to Helco. And this included again, approving the pricing and the waiver from competitive bidding. Now, one month later, within 30 days, on 8-26-17, Life of the Land, and actually Tahiri, which is the operator of the wind farm at South Point, filed an appeal with the Hawaii State Supreme Court on the PUC's DNO. The, uh, in, so a full, uh, almost two years later, the Supreme Court on the Life of the Land and Tahiri appeal they remand the case for the docket back to the Public Utilities Commission for a hearing uh, that would comply with procedural due process. Basically what they were saying was that you need to do more work on the GHG emissions. We want you to do a life cycle analysis, not just an avoided emissions as was done previously in 2017. So life cycle analysis, meaning from cradle to grade, cradle cradle to grave in other words how was this plant constructed how much steel was used what how much energy or co2 was in was emitted uh, in making the steel uh, 
uh, how much transportation, uh, how much CO2 was in the transportation, transporting the materials to, um, to Hawaii Island, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what they mean by cradle to grave, to the point where at the end of the 30 year purchase power agreement, what's gonna to happen to the, uh, the disposal of the power plant? And that's again, another estimate on the CO2, uh, CO2 uh, sequestration or emissions. So all of that is what is part of the life cycle analysis. They also uh, said that uh, whether the cost of energy under the purchase power agreement is reasonable in light of the potential for GHG emissions. So the, the, what this is interpreted as well, uh, GHG well, emissions has a well, impact this, on the environment. Uh, it's you know my dad passed away and so I'm I'm taking some of the stuff but not all of it. Um. And that's why it's easier to say this, this, and that versus. Uh, sorry, trying to figure out who's talking. Like Could saying, you mute yourself, please? Yeah, not everything's good. In fact, is that background noise? So, anyway, the third item was that whether the terms of the purchase power agreement are prudent and in the public interest. So, uh, fast forward, then uh, in September of 2019, the Public Utilities Commission issued a procedural schedule which took us from what are the issues that they identified, putting in statement of position, written testimony, inter interrogatories with evidentiary hearing uh, and then decision-making. Everything had a schedule on it up to the point of an evidentiary hearing. That's it, to be scheduled, to be scheduled. And this was in September of 2019. Then in July of 2020, the PUC issued an order denying Helco's request for a waiver, dismissing letter of request for approval of the amended and restated purchase power agreement and closed the docket. They just said, hey, we're gonna deny you the waiver. The waiver was never an issue in the appeal filed by Life of the Land and Tahiri. Anyway, so we, we then for, therefore went forward with appealing to the state Supreme Court, which resulted in the uh, favorable ruling uh, on our appeal. Uh, so the, as of May 24th, 2021, the um, so state Supreme Court again reiterated what they wanted. They said basically in so many words, this is the legal, non-legal terms which they use. Look, you guys dragged your feet for two years with Honua Ola or Hu Honua. Let's get on with it. And these are the same issues that we want you to address. So, so here we go. Uh, so that's where we got to where we are today in the current state. Um, next slide, Mas. I know we're kind of running long here, kind of talking more than I need to. Uh, basically, what is Honua Ola by energy? Hu Honua. We are a basically the HCPC plan redesigned as a biomass facility. What we're gonna do is burn basically wood chips from eucalyptus and from invasive species. So the power plant uh, has a, in the contract with Helco as a purchase power agreement up to, to provide up to 21.5 megawatts of power 24 seven. The plant is 99.5% complete, construction complete. Basically, all that remains to be done is finishing up one of the supply wells, which is a redundant well for us, which is an extra well, and then commissioning of the power plant. Uh, you can see through the other pictures, all the interior of the uh, systems that are in the electrical systems, the reverse osmosis. Um, and if you take a look at that uh, top picture, uh, I'll talk about this a little bit more, but the green, the green structures is basically inside of that is the boiler and also the turbine generator. Everything that's in silver is all what we call control emissions, uh, e equipment that controls the output of any emissions. So next slide. So this is the a concept of what we're asked, what we're, what Hunoola, Hunoo is all about. It's green, it's renewable, it's sustainable, 
and it provides power 24 seven. So if you look at the uh, starting at the upper left hand, upper right hand side, item number nine, those trees were planted in the late 1990s and the early 2000s by Prudential Timber on the Hamakua coast. This is a replacement crop for sugar. So, so fast forward, uh, what, 20 years, now the uh, trees are number 10, they're ready to be harvested. Uh, usually uh, what would have happened is that the trees would have been harvested after seven years, but because there was no uh, viable economic development plan to use the whole forest after several attempts had, had uh, taken place, everybody just folded up and walked away from it. So anyway, the trees are gonna be harvested. Um, it can be shipped to the plant, shipped, put into the boiler, the boiler makes steam, the steam turns the generator, generator makes electricity. So that is what we call our closed, uh, closed uh, loop system. The ash will be taken back to the field and be used as a fertilizer supplement for the new trees that will be regrown or those trees that generate shoots, what they call coppice, and will regrow by themselves. So this is why we call it a green, renewable and sustainable system. Next slide, Miles. <clears throat> Miles. So this is just an I, I what well, talk about economic benefits. So again, you got trees uh, create the. Uh, it helps the forestry industry, agriculture, manufacturing, transportation, and hydrogen, and maybe the development of hydrogen. So if you look at the tree, basically the uh, the one that we got on the right, right there about the tree, is that. Uh, Basically the top half or 60%, as we got noted here, is good for biomass, which is wood chips. The bottom half, the high value end product is lumber or timber. Timber, lumber, lumber being houses, lumber being construction, uh, lumber being, you know, cabinetry or studs or anything. Also what happens is that in the uh, economic benefits is that in a forest, you can have uh, coexistence with other type of industries like agriculture, like ranching, like dairy farming. Uh, and that has shown to work, particularly in other parts of the um, world, like New Zealand, uh, in the European countries. And they call that managed manage, uh, cattle production. Um, and again, this, is, this, this industry, if Honolulu goes, when Honolulu goes forward, will create a heck of a lot of jobs. And I think that's what we, we want on this island, jobs, because since the downturn of sugar, we, you know, we've just been going downward, spiraling, and uh, hopefully, we have, hopefully we haven't hit the bottom yet. But anyway, economic benefits. Next, uh, Miles, is environmental benefits also. Okay, so again, our plan is to be what we call carbon negative, meaning we plan to sequester more carbon than we emit over the life of this contract through the process, primarily through the process of re regrowing or planting new trees. Um, so in this uh, process, uh, we've already committed, uh, for example, uh, relative to carbon, carbon capture, carbon sequestration, we have existing contracts with, uh, on the Hamakua coast that uh, we are counting already as carbon credits. Also, we have an agreement with the National Forest Foundation to, once this thing goes forward to plant with them through the National Forest Foundation, 3.1 million trees over the first five years of this contract. So the, 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 windward, the, the windward side of the island or what we call the Hamakua coast is ideal for forestry. Next. This is uh, again, environmental benefits. Uh, how does this power plant operate? So we, we use uh, we two rows of water in this process. The first is non-potable water, which we, which we pull from our own wells uh, that we have on location. What do we, what do, we do with this non-potable water? We demineralize it uh, through a RO system and a demineralizer, and we use that in the boiler. 
the boiler convert the boiler heat, the heat in the boiler converts the water to steam, the steam turns the generator and the jet turns a turbine and turns the generator in return. That water is recycled through a condensation process back into the boiler. So that's the first use of water. The second use of water is we use salt water to condense the steam so that the steam can go back into the boiler. The salt, the salt water system uh, has three wells. We'll have three wells, approximately 12 to 1,200 to 1,300 feet deep in the salt water aquifer. And we will be drawing the cooling water from the salt water aquifer. After it goes through the condenser, it will be uh, re-injected through 800 foot deep wells into the salt water aquifer. So it's salt water draw and salt water injection. So that is the environmental benefit. We're not uh, taking from the brackish or the potable water supply to cool, to, con to cool or condense the steam from the turbine. The um, one thing that we do have is we have an additive that we're adding, to, it's a NALCO uh, non-hazardous additive that we're adding to the cooling water system. And the purpose of this is so that the manganese in the salt water doesn't adhere to the tubes in the condenser. Uh, so this dispersant, which is non-hazardous, is gonna be dispersed at a rate of maybe one part per 5 million uh, as it goes back into the salt water aquifer through the injection wells. Next, uh, Miles. Also, again, I talked about state-of-the-art emission controls. Uh, in the first picture, I showed uh, the aluminum part of the plant, which is on the right side. What we have is a mechanical dust collection, which is like a Dyson vacuum cleaner. What it does is, you know, collects all the particles and uh, uh, puts and then will uh, dispose of it in, in series. We we'll also have an electric static precipitator where there's charge plates and the remaining particles that pass the dust collector adheres to the uh, charge uh, plates and then the those uh, particles are then wrapped and then collected also. We also have selective catalytic reduction, which is there in uh, process uh, to, remo to remove uh, most of the NOx, nitrogen oxides from entering the flue stream uh, or getting out of the stack. Then we also have what we call a bag house filter, which is the last uh, series of uh, protection control. And so what's, it, what's coming out of the uh, actually out of the stack in itself will have very few particles and maybe it's you know, just gonna be basically warm, warm air coming out. So that's the best available control technology for emissions. Now, most plants uh, don't have any, any of these uh, in Hawaii. Uh, they may have some of them, may have, they may have a, a bag house or they may have a precipitator, but not all four of these items, yeah. And again, this is part of our effort to uh, make sure that uh, we uh, have or we operate you know, with a clean environment. Next. So what are the keys uh, to this for Hawaii Island? First of all, it does provide renewable energy to approximately 14,000 homes. It does eliminate or not eliminate or well, eliminate or reduce the amount of fuel oil, fossil fuel, that is uh, consumed annually, uh, whether it be residual oil, diesel, uh, naphtha, uh, they're all fossil fuels. And what it is, is that by growing trees here and not having to you know, import oil or petroleum, we are keeping the money basically on the island. And our estimate is that, you know, it's going to be 50, about in the, in the millions. You can see 56 million there. And then um, again, we, what we're looking at is 20,000 plus acres. And I talked about the 3.1 million trees to the National Forest Foundation. Uh, environmental benefits, again, um, we're going to be carbon negative. And our, our plan is that depending on how heavily we're dispatched by HELCO, uh, we plan to be carbon negative assuming that we get, we'll get into operation in 2022, carbon negative by 2035. Um, it does, again, this is all through greenhouse gas uh, re reduction and also, also through sequestration. 
Again, 100% of the fuel is locally grown, all in Hawaii, on the island of Hawaii. Economic benefits, and here we are, we're talking about jobs, jobs, and jobs. Yeah? And, uh, so next slide, uh, Miles. So I have a, a, a video that we put together that if you folks had come to the, uh, on a plant tour, which we're not having right now, because of the uh, COVID restrictions. I just wanted to share this with you, yes, especially since this is the Economic Development Committee of uh, the chamber, both chambers. Uh, Miles, can you uh, hit the play on that? Honua Ola, through many years, to three to 400 Honua Ola and contractors' employees to build. After the completion of every part, every phase, the employees celebrated and worked harder as they got closer to completion. Then I asked Forrest expert Marius Ellis and Dr. Guy Sellier about Forrest's job needed to produce the trees for the power plant. It's going to put a lot of money back into the economy, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's a lot of jobs. It's, it's the harvesting, uh, the trucking, then it becomes the replanting. Yeah. We have a nursery in Kona to oh. grow the seedlings. Already got outstanding research and educational institutions in Hilo. The University College of Agriculture and Forestry and the Hawaii Community College of Forestry Program. In which they're doing forest research on Honua Ola's land. Since biomass will use unusable tree sections and trees, there's potential to produce our own lumber. My name is Jason Fujimoto and I'm with HPM Building Supply, founded here in Hilo back in 1921. We're 100% employee owned and we employ over 400 owner employees across the state in Hawaii. Our mission and vision as an organization is to help all of our communities build better and live better. And one recent initiative that we've embarked on is called Holly Plus, and that is our smaller home factory built solution to really make it affordable for all of our community to achieve the dream of home ownership. Our building industry here in the state of Hawaii is 100% reliant on green dug fir, lumber, and wood products coming in from the Pacific Northwest and or Canada. Uh, for a variety of different reasons, we're now experiencing prices that are triple what they were almost a year ago. And that's astronomical. So I think for a lot of the suppliers and distributors here in Hawaii, um, we are always very open um, to exploring new alternatives. So I know, um, you know, on the Big Island, we have some huge forests of eucalyptus, and I think with the potential plans in place for uh, Honua Ula in uh, milling uh, these logs into potential construction type wood, you know, that would be something that HPM would be very uh, open to. I've been on this property since 98. Wow, so you know, like you're cutting all this kind of wood, it's all local from all local, local trees? It's all grown here local, wow. every bit of it. We cut albicia to uh, lemon gum to robustus, which is real popular, you know, so on what, and on and on. So you, are, you think a forest industry is so important? Well, you could make a sustainable in your business here, yes. Oh, so you know, where does all this wood go to? Uh, in the Hilo area alone, I have done over a thousand hardwood floors. Wow, a thousand? Over a thousand in so, the last 35 years, yeah. Wow, so what kind of trees are these? Mostly eucalyptus. Right now, these logs, the really nice logs, are coming from the Boy Scout camp. Forested, Boy, is that right? Forested trees. Makes a big difference. The, wow. the quality of the tree is two times better than if you get a tree that's a fence line tree or a road tree or, or a side that? or a property, property line tree because they're heavily limbed. These trees are not limp. It makes a big difference. You wow. get all clear lumber. How much are your hardwood flooring? My hardwood flooring ranges from 385 to 480 a square foot. And and like places like Home Depot, how much would that be? Oh, anywhere from six to eight. So why the price difference? Uh, I live in Hilo. I can afford to do it here in Hilo. Bamin Sidaki, owner of Medigo Dairy and former dairy farmer. What kind of change is necessary today? for dairy industry to survive here on our island. Without a doubt, and clearly, we have to produce our milk here locally. That you have to grow feed locally. 
and use our resources that we have right here. Silver pasture. So, so what? What is that all about? Raising uh, in uh, combination with forestry and basically using our resources uh, to fuller extent. You, you uh, prevent erosion, you manage your nutrients better, uh, the soil retains more moisture and you got better grass growing. So it's a good uh, symbiotic relationship. It's ideal for dry cows and heifers uh, where they can get shade, they can get higher quality forage. Also at the same time you have forestry that uh, support uh, the timber and the biomass industry. Two brilliant engineers, scientists, specialists in renewable energy, Paul Pontillo and Robert Hutchins, visited Honuaola Power Plant. Well, what was your impression? The plant, I thought, was extremely well done. It was state of the art for biomass. Um, the, the trees that have been planted along the Hamakua coast, if we're going to use that, to create electricity, especially base load, like we talked about, and we can make hydrogen especially from some of that power. The hydrogen used for transportation will offset more CO2 than what the trees ever did. Wow, never thought of that. Absolutely. So that's really important for us to transition from oil to a renewable, clean fuel like hydrogen. We've done a lot of different levels of uh, installations and I've done power plants on the mainland and I have to say the, the quality of the workmanship and the execution of the whole process I didn't see them missing anything. And we were impressed also with the cleaning. The cleaning, yeah. yeah. So I, I didn't expect it to be to, to that extent but they really went you know the extra yard to make sure that this charge on both right. the water right. and the gases were as clean as possible. Yeah, yeah, you look at half the plant, there's, there's just filtration and, right. <clears throat> and, and pollution control and it's all state-of-the-art stuff. There's nothing, I didn't see anything in there that was to the nth degree. He could eventually tie into creating of hydrogen. Oh, we hope so. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think that's something that should definitely be planned. Yeah. Uh, even with the excess, I mean, they're going to have eight and a half megawatts right. of yeah. excess and it, it would be a shame to throw that away, first of all, and waste it. Uh, but if we make hydrogen, like I said, that used for transportation yeah. will offset more CO2 than, you know, the trees. So what's going to happen here with this new forestry, if we create a forestry industry, it's going to create jobs, right? right. It's going to be sustainable, sustainable with the fuel yeah. and also we can have some lumber. It's all very exciting, but the power plant needs to open before all of that will happen. Okay, <laughs> okay. power plant needs to open. Power plant right. needs to open. So th thanks to Derek, he was a producer and director of that uh, short short video, but he pretty much recap captures uh, how important uh, other industries, uh, their potential development uh, apparently is tied to the uh, operation of, of uh, Honua Ola or Huhunua. But uh, so this is where we are before the Public Utilities Commission. We've actually filed we are going to file written testimony next week uh, on September 15th or 16th. And uh, then after that, we'll be uh, open to uh, responding to interrogatory requests or questions from the uh, Consumer Advocate, the Public Utilities Commission, the other parties uh, in the case, which would be Life of the Land and uh, Tahiri. Uh, so that's pretty much where we're at in this process. We are looking for, uh, you know, people that would support uh, Huhunua going forward, uh, you know, with letters to the uh, you know, Public Utilities Commission. Uh, there are the many benefits and how we are addressing uh, what they put out in their order. Uh, was there an express consideration of greenhouse gas emissions? I say yes, we do, are doing the life cycle analysis uh, and we're showing that we're going to be carbon negative, uh, hopefully by year uh, 2035. And at the end of the project, we'll be even more carbon negative, meaning we draw more carbon than we emit. And this does not include 
the emissions that are avoided from uh, the use of fossil fuels. The, uh, whether the cost of energy under the PPA, we believe that that shouldn't be an issue uh, because this was approved twice uh, in 2013 and 2017. Uh, is and but the, and the underlying question on the you see under the second bullet is the cost of energy under the PPA reasonable in light of the potential for GHG emissions? So if anything, I think the price should be higher. But we're not asking for a higher price because of the being carbon negative. Uh, whether the terms of the PPA are prudent and the public interest um, in light of its potential hidden and long-term consequences. From how I see it, the long-term consequences is that you get a stable energy price. Uh, this is a fixed price contract that we have. It's not uh, a price that uh, goes up and down with the uh, price of uh, fossil fuel. Uh, it's a fixed price and uh, there's a lot of hidden benefits and that's the, I think the potential in the uh, forestry industry and other related industries in agriculture uh, uh, for this, for the Hawaii Island. Uh, and again, there's a couple ways to uh, get this information or your thoughts to the Public Utilities Commission and I've got this on a slide and I'm sure my, um, Miles will make it uh, available. But at this point, I think we are going on for about half an hour or so, but open up to any questions if there are any. I'm sure there may be more than a few. Warren, this is uh, Alan Okinaka. Um, is the uh, plant capable of uh, using other types of material for fuel besides trees? Uh, anything, uh, the answer to that, Alan, is yes. Uh, uh, anything that is considered biomass we, that can be put into a chipper, uh, we can use. Uh, we are looking, besides the eucalyptus, uh, we are trying to see if, uh, well, we can, let, let's say we can burn invasive species like albizia, strawberry guava, gorse, uh, you know, that type of material, in which the, uh, you know, albizia is rampant over the whole island primarily on the west, on the east side. You got a lot of strawberry guava up in the forest, choking out the natural forest. I mean, if we can get access to that strawberry guava or even the gorse on Mauna Kea, you know, that's a win-win for us uh, and for the, uh, the county and the state, I believe. Yes, we can burn other than, we can burn other uh, types of biomass other than eucalyptus. Thank you. Mr. Lee, this is Glenn Kagumira. How are you? I'm fine, how are you Glenn? Good, good, thank you for giving us your time. In, in the um, complaint filed by Life of the Land, they compare the pricing um, between you and solar saying that solar, their solar is 22 cents a kilowatt hour. Is that um, just a production price? Or what would be the final price to the consumer? And, um, you know, is some of that power lost over the trans, was it the distribution lines and transmission lines coming from Kona to Hilo side? So what would be actually the final price to the consumer? Yeah, that's a Zelko question then. <laughs> <laughs> okay. let, let, so let me try. Let me try. I think I got the drift of your question though. Uh, but so, so let me, uh, I guess, put on my Helco hat and put on my Honoa Ola hat after this. Uh, so basically, uh, a solar project uh, with batteries or a solar project without batteries or a wind farm or anything from an independent power producer to include Huhonoa. We sell that generation to Helco, the, the utility, because it's a regulated utility uh, on the island and they transmit and distribute that power. So let's say that uh, in our case, uh, we, they, they, they will dispatch, you know, the, the utility business is you, dis, you dispatch enough generation to meet the demand. 
So it's demand driven, not supply driven. Okay, so the supply meets the demand. So the utility will purchase, uh, other than for operational reasons, reasons, the lowest cost energy being provided by IPPs and their own system. That's so that the rate pair gets the best price. So the generation component is one of it. Then they add in the transmission component, the distribution component, cost component, the customer service component and other things. And that's how you get to your 20 to 30 cents uh, per kilowatt hour, depending what rate schedule you're on. Uh, so the generation component is only one part of the price to the consumer. So, but going back to, since you said solar, um, you know, the, 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 the buzzword now or the buzz projects are solar plus battery, large solar farms with batteries. So the uh, public utility, I'm well, not public utility commission, but HECO, uh, ELCO put out two RFPs. Uh, the first RFP came in uh, a couple of years ago and they negotiated a contract with us. So it's a contract with a PV system feeding a 60 megawatt battery that can be discharged for four hours a day. And though the lowest bidders came in at eight to nine cents per kilowatt hour. On the other hand, Honua Ola's pricing per this pre previous contract, when you calculate it out, it's about 22 to 23 cents per kilowatt hour. But the difference is, is that one is available 24 seven, that's us, and the other one is available for four hours a day. So, uh, so if you wanted to, I don't know, do the simple math is that if something's available for four hours a day and you wanted to do an equal comparison, you multiply that by six, so six times eight is 48, 48 is greater than 23, and you know, da 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 da. You know, you know, those are just real simplistic, uh, 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 real simplistic. Comparison. Uh, did I lose that? Uh, still on. Okay, you can hear me. Hey, oh yeah, we see you. Yeah. Okay, I can hear you. you. See me? Okay, I cannot see you. How come I lost something here? But anyway, uh, so that's. Uh, I think I answered. Did I answer your question? Yes, especially that last comparison about uh, only four hours. And uh, yeah, so uh, so they put out a second RFP. Uh, how how could did, and I'm not sure if they negotiated the contracts already, but. Uh, they're looking at it. So, you know, it could be that uh, what I think, you know, relative to pricing, when you look at it on a uh, apples and apples basis, not an apples and orange basis. Yeah. Uh, uh, apples and oranges, solar and, and battery is cheaper, but you get less, less bang for the buck. But if you put it on an equal basis, uh, you know, the biomass project uh, really works price wise. Did, um, does the solar industry have to do a life cycle analysis too on their panels and batteries and silicon, lithium, and on and on? Uh, recently, yes. Uh, it, the, from what I've seen that they have done life cycle analysis on their system, the battery and the solar systems, yeah. Hmm. Warren, uh, this is Ron Terry. Um, is the PUC going to take up matters that are a little peripheral uh, to the, you know, what the, the, the strict legal um, questions that are before them? For example, you mentioned the ability to process invasive species biomass. I have dozens of clients who are attempting to get rid of strawberry guava. And the only thing they can do with it really is stack it up on their properties and allow it to decompose. That's the only, you know, choice right here. Otherwise, they're taking it to the landfill and paying exorbitant tipping fees. Um, what, um, what, uh, what can we do to in influence the PUC to consider issues like that? Or will they consider them automatically? Uh. 
actually you you can't well first of all the uh the the remand from the state supreme court was very narrow so that you know they said you don't have to relitigate this whole per renegotiate this whole purchase power agreement but actually our opponents life of the land they want to do that uh and you know and so the state supreme court basically said stick to the issues and the puc has some leeway sticking to the issue in, in, in moving from the issues uh, based on their discretionary approval. But back to your question about invasive species, Ron, we have that in our testimony that we plan to use up to 10% invasive species in our biomass facility. And the reason I say 10% is that when we went for the uh, covered source permit, which is uh, the fancy term for an air permit, air emissions permit, we specified that we would be using 90% eucalyptus and 10% invasive species, not knowing where the species and where we're gonna get the invasive species, except we know there's a hell of a lot out there, like you just said. So that is already gonna be as part of our testimony as to where our feedstock is. So uh, we like to burn, use invasive species, the strawberry guava and the gorse actually has a higher heating value uh, when we tested it than the eucalyptus. So the more gorse and um, strawberry guava and even ironwood uh, would really uh, generate more energy per cubic meter or per pound than the uh, grandest eucalyptus. So uh, I think you can put that into your testimony. We support this because this can help uh, get rid of the invasive species and not having it go to the landfill or be buried someplace and emit and release CO2 to the, uh, to the atmosphere, you know? Thanks. Warren, this is Mary. Are you considering um, Albizia in your invasive species as well? Yes, yes we are. Thank in you. Fact, uh, in fact, I've been talking, we've been talking to uh, DLNR actually, and uh, DOT about, about the invasive species. So why, you know, if you're going to trim a tree, uh, why take it to the landfill? You know, take it, bring it to us. You know, we'll take care of it. You know, it's kind of, that's oversimplifying it, of course. But uh, yeah, same thing with the uh, strawberry guava, which is, uh, you know, invading some of the prime, uh, I think, forest, forest land in, uh, that are uh, conservation zones, yeah. On the state in the in state lands, I think Ron knows probably a lot more about that than I do. But uh, yeah, it's it's just going to grow and grow, and going to choke everything out. Lauren, uh, you know, I have a question on, and I'm not sure if you answered this already, but with regard to if you had to compare uh, solar power with with battery backup uh, with the power that you that you would be developing. Is there any difference in the, you know, besides price, is there a difference in the quality of that energy? I think, you know, the, uh, well, first of all, the, uh, the power that we provide, uh, we can provide, uh, we can match, we just work at dispatch per the utility. They say go up, we go up, we go down, they want us down, we go down. And also what happens is that we provide what we call spinning reserve, that if they're, if we are, if our plant can operate, it actually can operate at maximum 30 megawatts. But let's say that, uh, and let's say that we're operating at uh, 10, 10 megawatts, and there's a system disturbance someplace where uh, some unit trips or go, goes out of service all of a sudden, we can come up, uh, ramp up the load per HECO requirements. I think it's one megawatt or one megawatt a minute or something so that we can save help. Not, we can, we cannot, maybe we won't save it depending on the size of the unit goes down, but we can help uh, lessen the area that is uh, uh, affected by lack of power because you know, you have your relaying systems and your safety systems. So our, we have some features um, like that the solar doesn't have. So we have basically also what we call a synchronous generator, which means that we have steam stored in the steam drum on the boiler, such that if 
uh, again, you need extra power. We got that power already in steam that we just send it to the turbine. So we got what they call quick load pickup, whereas, uh, you know, solar, if they're charging the battery, they don't have that uh, quick load pickup. Uh, but I think when the, all of it comes out, uh, Randy, about power quality, you know, power quality is 60 cycles per second, that uh, Helco being the aggregator of all this uh, power from different independent power producers and their own plants. They're the ones that ensure that the frequency doesn't deviate very much from 60 cycles per second with based on their dispatch center at uh, Kanelihua. So uh, individually, uh, when you look at the aggregate to the consumer, it doesn't affect the power quality, but each system uh, has its own attributes and disattributes. Thank you. You know, if the, if you don't have any other questions. I just wanted to share one thing with you on the uh, the video and talk about sustainability and economic development. Uh, you know, became kind of good friends with the new owner of Medago, Bamin Sadagi. And uh, he's the one that said that civil pasturing, uh, putting dairy cattle and forestry works. Uh, you know, his goal is that, so I asked him this, he said, I asked him, Bamin, how much uh, milk do you import to process uh, for milk, uh, raw milk, yeah? How much raw milk do you import? And, uh, and uh, he said, I have, he answered me this way. He said, I have access to 250 dairy cows, 250 dairy cows, which is located up in North, North Kohala. So I said, look, if you wanted to be independent of, uh, of um, importing raw milk, how many head of cattle would you need? He said, 10,000. 10,000, I said, so we generate that little milk, raw milk for, for local consumption. And he said, yeah, that's why I wanna do civil pasturing with you, Ward. Uh, we, once you get the forest. And I say, yeah, I like to do civil pasturing with you once we get a purchase power agreement. So it's one begets the other. And his plan also is to raise local, raise feed, soybeans, corn, to feed the cattle rather than importing it. Uh, so again, this is where we talk about the hundreds of jobs that can be created, uh, civil pasturing. Uh, uh, and and Bauman is just one example. So I said, well, how many, how many, uh, head of cattle, then how many, what, how many acres of pasture do you need for one head of cattle to get your 10,000? If, if you had 10,000, said, I would need 10,000 acres. And you know, he's talking 10,000 acres, I'm talking 20,000 acres plus. And I think, hey, I think we can work together. You can put the cattle in the trees. I can put the tr trees in one corner. You can put the cattle in the middle or we can put the trees all around and put the cattle in the middle. And there's all kind of models to work from, from civil pasturing. And uh, that's where, you know, I like to see it go because, you know, uh, and, and Derek Cariso said, I'm gonna buy all your milk, okay? Yeah, from Mountain Apple brand, you know? <laughs> so, so there's a lot of synergism here. It's just that it's like the video it says that, the power plant got to operate to, to create not only a green renewable power, but a sustainable work towards a sustainable economy. And I just wanted to share that with you because <clears throat> there's a lot of people rooting for us, but you know, uh, you know, you got to root loud or you got to write a letter or something. I don't know what the PUC, what drives the PUC, but it does appear that the PUC, uh, you know, the seems to be that they're primarily interested in solar plus battery. And uh, you know, if having run the utility before, solar plus battery have come a long way, have come a long way, but it's not there yet so that you can eliminate uh, any other type of steam generator. And uh, if, the, if the batteries, uh, uh, and if everybody's gonna put in a battery, you know, guess what? I mean, if I just, if I read two days, uh, press release, I guess, from, from the Biden administration, they want, they see 40% solar plus battery powering 40% uh, of the nation by year 2035. <laughs> guess what? It's supply and demand, right? <laughs> demand going up, 
supply is not there, price is going up. So uh, we live in a very difficult and very fluid uh, situation. So for the PUC to not make a favorable decision, uh, it's gonna have ramifications 30, 50 years out, I think, for the Big Island from the, from the standpoint of economic development. Hey, Warren, <clears throat> it's Glenn again. Yes, Glenn. The, uh, coming back to the dairy cattle, do you think you folks would ever diversify into biogas so that uh, the farmer could sell the manure instead of having it cause environmental problems? Uh, we, we haven't looked at the manure itself. The methane, if that's what you're referring to. Yes, yes, exactly. But methane is a greenhouse gas. Uh, uh, we haven't looked into that. Uh, uh, hopefully, uh, with the, if we can get into civil pasturing with the um, cattle ranchers, just like the dairy <clears throat> ranchers, that maybe some of that methane issue will, uh, <laughs> I have to say this word, but dissipate. <laughs> Yeah, but that's the knock on the cattle, right? Is they produce a lot of methane. But yeah, that's one of them. That's, it, the, that's the chicken field commercial. If it can be captured, it doesn't it turn into a? Doesn't it get considered as a renewable? Yeah, it does. And uh, there's actually this uh, pilot program going on right now down in Kau, at Kau High School. It's the uh, the Japanese uh, agricultural uh, technology. And they're using the manures and they're making, you know, the compost and everything and putting that back into agriculture. But, you know, at one point, some, somebody told me you shouldn't be using manure for, ag for, for produce, fresh produce. So, <laughs> I don't know, it got to be sterilized, I guess, yeah, before you use it to, to plant anything. I mean, I'm sure there's a lot more involved with it than uh, what I just said, but certainly uh, you don't want to have the, uh, the bacteria there and, and, uh, and other uh, stuff that shouldn't be there for fertilizer purpose. You know, I'd rather have to use our ash on the power plant as a supplement. Okay. Yeah, well, thank you, thank you. So um, do we have any last questions? we got time for maybe one more question before we uh, end this uh, presentation today. Randy, it's Jen. I was gonna make one quick, um, comment uh, for Huhonua. I think one of the things with the battery uh, solar projects, all of the ones that we're seeing, even though our RFP doesn't um, say where it has to go, it's all on the west side. So as we want to balance generation, Huhonua is on the east side of the island. And I think um, it's important to just understand that part as well. Yeah, that's a very good comment. Uh... I was going to call you Zelko. I'll call you Zelko. Hey, Zelko. That's a very good comment because you also got to remember is that, uh, you know, PGV is located in the rift zone. Uh, you know, when I was uh, at Public Works, you know, and the flow in 2014, right, Randy, was going towards Pahoa Town. But initially, all the vul vulcanologists were thinking that it was going to follow the rift zone, but apparently it took the, uh, the helo leg and it stayed away from PGV. But in the the, uh, the most recent flow, it went through uh, well, right adjacent to PGV and only took out the, uh, the substation and transmission lines. But I think uh, diversity of location, uh, splitting the power uh, locations is important. Um, and not to mention hurricanes. I think Pune gets hit more than uh, uh, Hamakua, you know, as far as the intensity of uh, tropical storms and hurricanes. But uh, good point, Jen. Warren, uh, this Warren, this is Alan. I got a quick question. Um, it, you know, the uh, solar energy requires um, the photovoltaic cells and uh, batteries and everything, and those things eventually have to be, um, you know, they wear out or they become they decompose and they have to be managed as a material, a hazardous material that whatever they're going to turn it into. Is that part of the equation when they compare solar with, uh, uh, what do you call them, biomass uh, fuel? Yeah, you know, I haven't uh, seen any comparison uh, officially, 
in the in a docket in a docket. I qualify that, Alan. But the uh, as asked earlier, the uh, greenhouse gas analysis has to be done for solar plus battery projects. And you know, based on my limited reading, if you take a solar plus battery project and you do a life cycle analysis, true, it doesn't have any greenhouse gas emissions once it's operating, but it takes a lot of fossil fuel or energy to create or to, uh, to mine the lithium, <coughs> to, to transport the lithium uh, and to create that battery. And same thing with the solar cells, but, and then, you know, the solar, uh, the, the, so, the solar, the solar and the batteries, I think they give you like a, a, a 20 year guarantee uh, and then maybe it goes for 30 years, but it'll degrade. So actually part of the life cycle analysis is that how do you dispose of this also? So I guess what I'm getting at is that with my limited reading, if you look at the life cycle analysis, the uh, greenhouse gas, I think that the solar is higher, solar and battery is higher than biomass. Yeah, I was thinking that because, um, again, with my limited reading about uh, how they manage uh, batteries and panels after they've gone through their life cycle, uh, it's, there's a lot of unknowns and it's not clear as to what, how they're going to do it and what they're going to do it and how they're going to, you know, maybe recreate new batteries or whatever. Uh, even getting rid of our uh, nickel cadmium batteries and you know the simple alkaline batteries we have here, it, it, it goes into the landfill. It, it, <laughs> it'll probably create a problem for us in the near future. So there has to be a way to manage that. And um, okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks a lot, Warren. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. Good, Good question. Thank you, Warren. Um, hey, uh, we we've reached our time. Uh, so I want to, again, thank you, Warren, for your presentation. Thank you, everybody, for your great questions. And again, um, Miles will be able to send out some information on how we can uh, support uh, Warren and, and, and his plans going forward. Uh, Miles, do you have any last announcements that, that you'd like to make? Um, no, I'm good. And yeah, thanks again for everyone for, to everyone for participating. We'll catch you next time. All right. Thank you, everybody.